folklore, the beliefs, traditions and culture of the people. Passed on in the most part through the spoken word, folklore expresses our values, our shared ideas with others. It is both how we were and how we are. Without a record, our customs and traditions may become lost to us in the present, but under the surface, we still draw on them. We still know. It's time to recall our forgotten history and to record the new. This is the Folklore Podcast. Victorian London. Fog rolls down the streets. Horses' hooves clatter on the cobbles. Strains of violin music seep from the upper windows of 221B Baker Street. And in small dim parlours all over the city, groups of people are communing with their lost loved ones. This is the time when spiritualism was in its ascendancy, both here and across the seas, and the chance to speak to the dead was taken up and believed in by many. Welcome to the Folklore Podcast. I'm Mark Norman, folklore researcher and author. Now we've spoken a number of times on the podcast about the role of the folklorist and how we're not looking to prove or disprove a particular phenomena, but we're more interested in why people pursue particular beliefs, why those beliefs are important in a culture, and how they draw on the culture around them. So the purpose of tonight's examination is not to debate whether spiritualism and the work of the medium is a real phenomenon, pure charlatanism, or a mix of the two. What is certain is that there were a large number of fraudulent mediums in Victorian times. So we set out today to examine some of the more well-known cases where these were brought to book, the laws used to do so, and some of the methods employed by these people to defraud their clients. It is worth spending a few minutes tracing back through history the passage of the law that led to the acts against which Victorian mediums were prosecuted, for these acts developed over many hundreds of years. In the time of King Henry VIII, an act concerning Egyptians provided some severe punishments for offences such as the telling of fortunes. Now we should note at this point that the term Egyptians is not used to refer to people of that area of the world, but rather is used in particular to talk of gypsies and those of that ilk. The markets and souks of Egypt were, of course, well known for having many fortune tellers and the like, and their professed abilities, like those of the Indian fakirs, were the same as those used by the travelling gypsies of whom we speak here. The Tudor age stated that anyone using great, subtle and crafty means to deceive the people was to leave the country within 16 days of the proclamation against them being uttered. The next act passed from this also penalised, to the extent of £40, any person conveying into England such Egyptians who, after a sojourn of one month, automatically became felons. Moving on into the time of Elizabeth I, an act directed against fond and fantastical prophecies, especially where these concerned the death of the monarch. In 1597, an act for punishment of rogues, vagabonds and sturdy beggars increased the punishment for offences which would have been classed in Victorian times as mediumship. Any person convicted under this act would have been stripped to the waist, whipped and sent round the parishes. Over time, the laws against fortune-telling and prophesying became gradually less severe. On June 21st, 1824, a new act was passed which would be applied to Victorian mediums. Offenders prosecuted under this act could be sent to a house of correction for up to three calendar months, there to undertake hard labour. 
All of these just mentioned were essentially vagrancy acts, and parallel to these were acts which prohibited spirit intercourse. From the way that these acts were worded, it is quite clear that the authorities did not doubt that this phenomenon was possible. This provides a brief historical sketch on how fortune tellers and the like were prosecuted. It was a much more rare event for a fraudulent physical medium to be prosecuted, and where this did occur it was usually under the offence of obtaining money under false pretenses. There were few attempts at reforming the laws before the current acts came into force in the 1950s. On July 1st 1930, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle headed a deputation to the Home Secretary to try and make it easier for mediums, but nothing came of this. In November of the same year, the MP for Rochdale, Alderman W.T. Kelly, introduced a bill making mediumship legal if the medium was approved by a registered spiritualist or psychical society, but this was talked out and was never passed. Probably the most famous legal case connected with psychic research was the widow Mrs. Jane Lyon, aged 75, who adopted the medium D.D. Home as her son on condition that he changed his name to Home Lion. This condition was imposed by the spirit of her dead husband, who was working through Home. The same spirit also induced her to give him a fortune of £30,000 cash and to settle upon him a similar amount. She eventually saw sense and took him to court. The ruling was that he could not keep the gifts but Mrs Lyon had her costs refused because she had continually lied during her evidence, presumably to mask her stupidity. This case took place in 1865. A similar case, heard in 1903, became known as the Great Planchette case. Henry Shepherd Hart Cavendish, aged 26, brought an action to set aside a voluntary settlement whereby he gave Major Charles Henry Strutt and his wife Madeline, the medium, almost total control of his estate. He, like the previous case, pleaded undue influence. Mrs Strutt persuaded him using spirit messages from his deceased mother and the archangels Gabriel, Michael and Uriel. The messages came via table tipping automatic writing, and especially the planchette. Another interesting legal case was named by ghost hunter Harry Price the £1,000 Ghost. In the year 1877, the Archdeacon Thomas Colley, rector of Stockdale, had a séance with the infamous medium Reverend Dr Monk. During this séance, a vapour-like substance exuded from the left side of Monk, formed into various apparitions, and was then reabsorbed. In 1906, Colley wrote a pamphlet about the event and sent a copy to the famous magician John Neville Maskelyne. Colley offered Maskelyne £1,000 if he could reproduce the phenomena as a conjurer. This he subsequently did at St George's Hall with an illusion known as the side issue but Collie refused to pay, calling the version of Monk's miracle a travesty. Maskelyne sued for the money, but Collie counterclaimed damages for libel because Maskelyne had stated in his own pamphlet that Collie was not, and never had been, an archdeacon. Maskelyne lost on both counts. This fact seems rather odd when you consider that it was stated in evidence that in 1876, the year before Collie sat with him, Monk was exposed by an amateur conjurer named H.B. Lodge, who had searched his luggage and found the usual cheesecloth, reaching rods, spirit hands, etc., as well as a number of obscene letters from women. In fact, the police prosecuted Monk, and he was sentenced to three months' imprisonment. Moving on a little later in time from Victoria's reign, in 1928 the one and only raid on a spiritualist stronghold took place at the London Spiritualist Alliance. Three summonses each were issued against Mrs Claire Cantlin, medium, and Miss Mercy Fillimore, secretary of the LSA. On the instructions of the Commissioner of Police, Detective Inspector Walter Burnaby of Scotland Yard sent three women for seances, all of whom were in the employ of the police. Cantlin was accused of having professed to tell fortunes, and Fillimore for aiding and abetting. The defence was that the medium was not telling fortunes, and further, that as she was in a trance, she knew nothing of what transpired. 
She later pleaded guilty to a technical offence and the secretary pleaded not guilty. Both were eventually prosecuted. It was hoped that this would become a test case, but the Home Secretary did not propose to do more. The press mostly tended to favour the defendants in their reporting, and the case generally was seen as a waste of police time. The spiritualists, of course, rushed into print to protest at the raid and subsequent prosecutions. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle wrote to the Times in typical Annoyed of Tunbridge Wells style, the Home Secretary has informed me officially that there is no hope of a change in the law. This is not a wise resolution. We are a solid body, numbering some hundreds of thousands of voters. Having looked at some of the more significant cases brought in law, let us turn our attention now to the fraudulent activity which enabled some of these and other charlatans to be exposed and prosecuted. According to the Victorian mediums, seances were the most productive way to get in touch with the spirit world. A typical seance, presided over by a physical medium, could boast all sorts of strange activity, such as the movement of objects, eerie music and other sounds, ghost lights, levitating furniture, and at the more extreme, the production of ectoplasm and the materialisation of spirits. These seances were conducted in a dark or nearly dark room, the mediums would claim that this made it easier for the spirits to manifest. Critics naturally charged that such conditions made it much easier to conceal the practice of fraud. Thanks to the obvious fraud which did take place, committees of both scientists and laypersons formed to investigate the claims of the mediums. These groups and individuals essentially became the first organised paranormal investigators and would found what became the ghost research field of today. Many magicians also became involved in exposing the fake mediums, as indeed some still do, thanks to the fact that they easily recognised the sleight of hand tricks and illusions that were being advertised as being due to the work of spirits. Some of the methods used by the fake mediums were blatantly simple, but also clever when used in a darkened room and under conditions where the sitters were primed for something unexplained to occur. In the most dramatic seances, spirit forms would materialise. This was sometimes accomplished by trap doors and sliding panels, which remained concealed in the dark, and even by assistants wearing costume, makeup, and wigs. On occasion, even the medium might change into costume in the dark room. One medium, who was debunked by the Society for Psychical Research, was found to have wigs and makeup concealed in a chair with a false back. Some mediums were caught walking on their knees, pretending to be the spirits of children who had passed over. Spirits that would float about the room were created by taking small balloons that could be inflated and painting faces on them. An adjustable fishing rod was used as a good tool for operation in the darkness of the seance room. Objects would be attached to this line and waved over the sitters' heads. A stuffed glove attached to the line would make it look like spirit hands were touching the sitters. To appear more convincing, the medium would often insist that people inspected the spirit cabinet before the sitting. Here, one of the sitters would be a confederate and be the last one out, leaving the required tools. Alternatively, while the assistant who manned the cabinet closed the curtains, the medium would reach under the accomplice's coat and remove the bag. This was put back when rousing the medium. The accordion test was often written about during the heyday of spiritualism. The instrument would be placed in a wire cage or other spot away from human hands. In order that the spirits could play music, a couple of methods were used. The most complicated employed an air hose which would play on the keys. The most simple used a hidden harmonica which could be played in the dark and would be mistaken for the accordion. Another simple trick was to place a bell under a glass or alternatively in a box or cage. Here a duplicate bell was used. By muffling the ringer with some clear tape, it would make it sound as though the noise was coming from under the glass. The magician Joseph Dunninger revealed another method where a violin placed on a table was played. A resin thread with a weight on one end had been laid across the violin so that the weight dangled over the edge of the table. When a hidden assistant pulled the thread, in this case through the keyhole of the door, the resin rubbing against the strings produced the noise. 
These were all quite simple methods. More sophisticated sitters insisted that the mediums were restrained. However, many mediums were adept escape artists, so this was not considered hugely effective. Instead, the mediums offered the sitters the opportunity to remain hands-on with them. This would often take place at a large table. Sitters alternated male and female around the table. The person on the medium's right would hold their right wrist with their left hand, and so on around the table. This took place after the room had been darkened. It would now seem that nobody, including the medium, could move their hand without their neighbour knowing. After the manifestations, the light would be turned on, and everyone would still be secured to their neighbour. No accomplices were required here, even for large phenomena to occur, as everything could be achieved with one hand. But those on either side of the medium stated that they did not let go for an instant. After the light was turned off, the medium requested to be released for a moment to get a handkerchief, or for some other small, insignificant reason. Moments later, the sitters would be asked to take the wrists or hands again. This time, the sitters would unwittingly both hold the same hand, one holding the hand and the other the wrist. Described in this way, the tricks seem very basic and silly, but they were very effective under the heightened conditions of the seance. A tipping or rocking table with no ropes attached could be moved using a hook attached to the medium's belt or foot. As well as the trick with the wrists, some mediums would also use a trick shoe from which they could remove their foot, then using their toes to grab objects such as a bell under the table to move or shake. Levitations were also easily accomplished. The medium would sometimes stand on their chair or gently press the sole of their shoe onto the hand or shoulder of one of the sitters. Alternatively, while on the chair, removing their shoes and holding them meant the medium could move them around and ask one of the sitters to hold the heels to stop them floating away. In more modern times, of course, these acts of physical mediumship have all but died out and are now mostly the realm of the magician, as such items as the spirit cabinet, levitating table and the like still resonate with the audience, but just in a different way. Mediumship, of course, still continues, both in spiritualist churches and in live events and televised ones. Some people will argue that the techniques here are just as fraudulent as the ones we have been discussing, utilising plants, prior research and cold reading techniques. Others have more faith in the abilities of the medium. As mentioned earlier, it is not the place of the folklorist to debate whether these abilities are genuine fraudulent or a mix of the two. In this case, we just acknowledge some of the events that did occur, and note how the acts of physical mediums, both exposed and unexplained, have entered into the canon of folklore. Thank you for listening to the Folklore Podcast. You will notice that this episode has been a little shorter than usual, this is both due to the fact that the previous episode, our crossover with Monster Talk podcast, was a feature-length episode and therefore took a lot more time to produce, and also because Easter falls in this month, and some of us, even folklore researchers and people who present podcasts for general listening, occasionally need to have a little bit of a break. Having said that, I hope that you've still enjoyed this slightly shorter episode, and next month we'll be back to our usual routine of a presentation by myself on the 1st of the month and our guest interview on the 15th. See you next time. The Folklore Podcast is created and hosted by me, Mark Norman. Find out more about my writing and research at www.facebook.com slash Mark Norman Folklore. The Folklore Podcast Art Director is Melissa Martell. Find her work at www.mdmcreate.com. The Folklore Podcast will always be free to listen to, but it is an enormous amount of work to research, create, record and write two of these episodes every month. And so we have created a simple way in which you can help to support the ongoing life of the Folklore Podcast. Please visit our website at www.thefolklorepodcast.com and click on support 
There are various ways that you can help, and they don't all involve giving us money. Even just leaving a simple review on iTunes or other podcast apps helps to grow our audience. So please do visit and take a moment to help us to keep going. Thank you for listening. The Folklore Podcast theme music is written and performed by Gurdy Bird.